Hey everybody, this is Dean with LSG Media, and today we are going to learn how to play Arkham Horror, the card game. Simply put, this is a game in which the investigators are going to be trying to gather clues to advance the act deck, whilst the enemies try to advance the agenda deck with a mechanic known as Doom. Now, as I've already mentioned, this is a card game, and it's deck-based, which means that you will be creating a deck and then taking that deck into a scenario with the hopes of getting out with your sanity intact and, of course, your life. Now, if you're a beginner to Arkham Horror the card game, number one, you don't even know how to play. Number two, let alone building a deck. Building a deck is more of an advanced concept. So we're not going to really get into deck building. But this tutorial will assume that you have the revised core set. And within the revised core set is a bunch of cards, and you can actually have a starter deck with those cards. And the starter deck can be constructed with explicit instructions on what cards come in that, or what cards are supposed to be in that deck based on a list given to you inside the how to play guide. Now, assuming you have the revised core set, you would like to keep the following items handy as we go through this tutorial. Number one, you want to get your how to play guide, you want to get your rules reference, and you want your Knight of the Zealot campaign booklet. Of course, there's a bunch of cards and tokens as well. Now, a basic game goes like this. You choose an investigator, you choose who the lead investigator is, you assemble your deck, you assemble your tokens, you assemble the chaos bag, which is essentially your random number generator. Not unlike dice, it will throw some randomness into the game. Then you, have to, you, then you will take your starting resources of five, and we'll get into what those resources do. Then you'll draw your opening hand of five. You can then mulligan any of those cards away in exchange for an equal amount of cards that you discard. To get a decent hand, right? You don't want to start the game with a terrible hand. Usually the thinking goes you want some assets in play because assets assets are how you build up your uh, board state. You'll hear a lot of game uh, card game people use that term, board state. It's just a way to represent the cards that are in play doing things for you. And that's something that holds true in Arkham Horror, the card game as well. You want a good board state to start. And then after that, you're going to set up the table and hide the playing, commit cards, what skill tests work, and what all the actions are you can do. So now that you have that basic rundown, let's dive into each one of these one step at a time. Now, if you look at the screen, you'll note that we are using something called Arkham Horror the Card Game Super Complete Edition on Tabletop Sim on the PC. Now, this type of program does create a bit of game setup atrophy because it can be done with simple clicks to get everything set up. The reality is that Arkham Horror the Card Game doesn't always have a super intuitive setup. you got to pay attention to what the campaign book tells you to do. Because remember, you are going to take your investigator and that deck, and you're going to dive into one of these scenarios and hope to get out alive. Now, we're looking at Tabletop Sim, and we're looking at the Arkham Horror Super Complete Edition, and what we're going to do is, because I'm assuming that you don't have this, and I'm assuming that you do have the core revised set, we're going to go right there right now. So we're going to download the core revised set. I'm going to place these scenarios down. Come on now. And um, we're going to immediately just place the very first scenario called The Gathering. Now, if we come over here, this, uh, here are some things you're going to want. I'm going to actually go into this. Again, I'm trying to simulate the things you'd actually have on your tabletop at home. So let me blow this up a little bit. There we are. Blow this up a little bit. There we are. Make that a little bit bigger. Perfect. So as I mentioned, these books you have in front of you, the rules reference, learn to play, and of course, the Knight of the Zealot campaign book. Now, with any type of game you play ever, you break open a box, you're trying to figure out what goes where, how do you know any of this stuff. Well, the game is pretty forgiving in terms of that it tries to tell you explicitly what you must do every step of the way. So if we go back to what I said at the beginning, we choose our investigator. So let's start there. Now, for the purposes of this game, we are going to be using a starter deck. So I'm going to come up here. I want my starter decks. Here we go. 
So, we're gonna take Roland, we're gonna take this guy, we're gonna drag him all the way down here. And we're gonna stick him in our play area. Now, obviously you don't have this program. You have the cards, the physical cards. But here's the good news. The instructions are all in here, right? If you flip through through a few, a few pages here, you're going to see all the components that you're looking at. Your player cards, how many, resource tokens, damage tokens, horror tokens, etc. It's going to tell you your first game setup. We covered all this. We've already chosen our investigator Roland Banks. We already have assembled our deck. And uh, we're going to summon the, uh, assemble the token pool next. Uh, which we already have, actually. The game does that, too. And then the chaos bag, resources, opening hand scenario set up for the gallery. Okay. Now, we already have the scenario set up. That's what this is up here. This tells you a little bit about the scenario. But before that, I'm going to show you how we get here. Let me just clean this up a little. It's a bit messy. We'll explain what that is in just a minute. If we come down here to Night of the Zealot, we can see, okay, great, Night of the Zealot. There is flavor text that you should read out loud. Then you go to the campaign setup. If you come back to the booklet, scenario setup down in the right-hand corner, it tells you, read this scenario introduction for the gathering. You see how it says it right here? Well, that's what this is right here. Now, we've got our investigator, and now we have to choose our difficulty. So this is where we're going to get into skill tests a little bit. And although this doesn't necessarily, um, this isn't probably the best way to do this, but just for some simple purposes, we're going to blow this card up really big. And I want to draw your attention to this. Assemble the chaos bag. Place the chaos tokens indicated below into the chaos bag and return the other chaos tokens to the game box. Now this is based on the difficulty you chose in step three of the campaign setup right? Easy, standard, hard, expert. I pretty much play on standard exclusively. I don't play easy and I don't play hard. If you're feeling like you want a bit of an easier experience, pick easy. If you want to go hard, pick hard. If you're a new player, I do not recommend playing on hard. <clears throat> now, in at, at home, you're going to have a bunch of tokens, as indicated right here on your component section. See how it says 44 chaos tokens with a variety of symbols. And those symbols mean things, and then there are numbers, and those numbers also mean things. So, what I'm going to do to make this simple is I'm going to take every one of these, and I'm going to bring them over here for ease of reference. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you come down here, it tells you two skulls. Two skulls. It tells you... A uh, this is called a cultist token, a tablet, auto fail, and an elder sign. All those are represented according to the book, which is great. So, assuming you don't have tabletop sim in this particular mod, you're going to assemble the tokens as they as you see them here, as instructed by this guide, and that's that. Then you would take these and you'd stick them in a bag. Now, I believe the revised course that comes with this really neat. Uh, chaos bag and you stick all those tokens in the chaos bag and here's a pro tip for you if you can get plastic coin protectors it makes the chaos bag much better because these cardboard pieces are going to be jingling around getting banged up over time and they're going to you're going to start to feel you might feel the negative uh, you might feel the negative three token feels a little different and you want to be tempted to cheat so if you get if you get coin protectors and clip these inside of those plastic coin protectors, they jingle around in the bag with a lot more, uh, it's a lot more uh, interesting, a little bit more attention and dramaticness when you shake the bag and they all jingle around versus if they're just quiet cardboard scraping against each other. So that's just a quick pro tip for you. Okay, so this is dice, okay? This replaces dice. Now, this is called an elder sign token. And an Elder Sign token is unique to each investigator. These tokens, the skull, these, as we we're told to assemble, mean something according to the scenario card. As you can see, a skull means negative X. X is the number of ghoul enemies at your location. That doesn't mean anything to you right now, but it will once we get going. And then you have numbers. Great. What do these numbers mean, Dean? I have no effing clue what you're talking about, dude. 
Okay, to properly understand the numbers, we have to apply how they would operate in skill tests. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually lead this tutorial, the bulk of this tutorial off with skill tests. And the way we're going to do that is we are going to discuss the different types of actions that you can take as an investigator that may call for a skill test. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to engage in an investigate action. We're going to show you how that works. Then we're going to do a fight action against a ghoul enemy. And then we are going to do an evade action against a ghoul enemy. So you can see all the different permutations of how skill tests will work. Additionally, we're going to resolve an encounter card that has a revelation, like a treachery revelation, I guess would be the best way to say it. That way you get a certain sense for how skills operate. When we get into the phases of the round, we'll talk more about some of the actions like moving, drawing a card, or getting a resource, as those don't typically require a skill check. There are some move actions that do. Um, when you have to move into an area, sometimes if there's a barrier, the barrier could prevent you from entering the area, so you have to make a check to enter the area. And by area, I mean location. So let's start things off right now. Okay, first things first. We got Roland Banks here, and we have a machete and a cop in our uh, <laughs> in our assets that we control. We've sort of mushed everything together here on Tabletop Sim, and now we're going to draw this ghoul enemy down here. So the ghoul enemy is down here, and he is engaged with us. I'm just going to grab these tokens, and we're going to just kind of stick them here, I guess. It doesn't really matter, because we're not going to draw randomly for the purpose of this tutorial. So... Whenever you are forced to draw an encounter card that's an enemy that doesn't have spawn instructions, it spawns engaged with you. You don't have to worry too much about that. We will talk about drawing cards from the encounter deck as we get a little bit deeper into this tutorial. But for the purposes of understanding the assembly of the chaos bag, which we were just talking about before this segment, I'd like to show you why the chaos bag tokens are relevant to you. And to do that, I have to show you how they are showcased within a skill check. So as we went over, the manual tells you how to assemble these tokens. Whatever your scenario is, the scenario is going to tell you to gather X amount of these tokens. Now, most of these numbers are going to be self-explanatory, but the symbols are not. And that, of course, is where this scenario reference card comes in. And it looks like I made my, uh, my tokens disappear again. So I'm just going to come over here and take them back. I pulled the, the, the when I pulled the scenario card, it confused the logic of the game. So it doesn't really matter. So we'll keep these up here for this purpose. Okay. So a ghoul minion is in our threat area. And you're going to learn about threat area a little bit more as we get into this. But the threat area is essentially the area right above your play area where you put various treacheries and enemies and other things in play like weaknesses. Essentially, it's called your threat area because the things in that area are threatening to you. <laughs> That's a good way to remember. Uh, these here are little action token designators. Um, you get three actions per turn. Each time you take an action, you flip one of these. And then you, this little guy we keep on our investigator card because what it does is it helps us uh, track the special ability that Roland Banks has, which is a reaction trigger. After you defeat an enemy, discover a clue at your location. We'll talk a little bit about uh, triggers as well. There's a lot of different uh, confusing terminology in this game, believe me. So back to the, the, uh, the token pool. So the token pool, which goes into the chaos bag, which we mentioned earlier, is something that you don't see. So normally these are in some sort of black bag. You shake it up when you're called upon to take a test, and you randomly draw one of these tokens out of that bag. The numbers, as I said a moment ago, are going to be self-explanatory, but the symbols may not be. And that's where the scenario reference card comes in. Depending on your difficulty, hard expert, easy standard, I recommend easy standard, it will tell you what the tokens that are in the pool do. As you see, the skull is pulled, you get negative X, where X is the number of ghoul enemies at your location. Anytime an enemy is engaged with you, it is considered to be at your location. So Roland's in the study, the ghouls engage with Roland, ghoul is at the study. So the ghoul is considered at my location, obviously, if he's engaged with me, so if I draw the skull token, I get a negative one for this check. The cultist token is a negative one. If I fail, I take a horror, which is bad, as Roland only has five. So taking one horror is 20% of your sanity. If you think about it that way, it makes you go, hmm, I should probably be aware of that. 
And then finally, the tablet token, as it's known, is a negative two. If there is a ghoul enemy at your location, take one damage. Now, if we bounce back over here, uh, there's an elder sign and an and another token. You didn't see these on the scenario reference card because the manual, which you'll note if you are following along within it, will tell you what these do. This is an auto fail token. That means no matter what happens, if you pull this token and it is applied to your final result, you will fail automatically, no matter what. And then your elder sign token is not necessarily an automatic success. This is not Dungeons and Dragons. Right? Some people equate this with rolling a 20 and this with rolling a 1. Not really, because uh, the Elder Sign doesn't always mean you're going to hit. Instead, it tells you on your front of card, see the little Elder Sign effect, colon, plus 1 for each clue in your location. So in this particular situation, as we've already determined, we're at the study, engaged with a ghoul. So if we pull Elder Sign, we're going to get a plus 2 to this check. So let's get into exactly how these numbers work within the context of the Chaos Bag, which we've assembled. So in this particular uh, moment in time, we are going to be engaging in a fight action. In fact, let me come down here, and uh, I'm actually going to clone this dude. I'm going to bring it over here so we have a reference. Bing! And then I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to clone this dude, because we're going to need this as well. My table's getting cockeyed. Uh, as, a, as a way to sort of... Uh, follow along in the uh, in the phases as it were so i'm gonna where, where does this want to go uh, that's fine okay so if we come over here to the actions that we can take we're going to be focusing on the ones that require skill checks for now so we're, that's going to be a investigate fight and evade so those three actions are always going to require some kind of check most of the time activating a trigger does as well i guess it depends on the card and uh, we'll talk about that stuff. But let's continue with our skill check example. So Roland has been engaged by a ghoul minion. And that would have happened in the mythos phase because I would have drawn one card from the top of the encounter deck. Anytime you draw an enemy from the encounter deck, unless it has a spawn instruction, which would be very obvious on this card, it would spawn engaged with the investigator who drew it. For demonstration purposes, I know that there is a enemy here that spawns elsewhere. We might want to talk about prey. I believe, yeah, this 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 kind gentleman. <laughs> so, if you pull the ice school, it says spawn in the cellar. Now, this is for getting a little bit deeper into the uh, campaign or this particular scenario, the gathering, because. As you advance into this, more locations open up on the table. And one of those locations is the cellar of the house you're in. And this states spawn in the cellar. So he would spawn down in the cellar when that was in location, when that was in play. So that's, that's what I mean by spawn instructions. Now, suppose for just, just for fun, pretend the study is in fact the cellar. If it says he spawns in the cellar, he does spawn in the cellar. But he would still spawn engage with you if you were in the cellar. Because any ready, unengaged enemy that's in the same location as an investigator automatically engages that investigator. Okay? Now, if there are two investigators in the cellar and you, and you pulled this and it said spawn in the cellar, it would come, it would be spawned into the cellar and then the lead investigator would decide who he is engaged with. Okay? Spawn instructions are, are kind of funny like that. And then there's one other weird uh, weird one, and that's called Prey. Prey is if the monster has two choices to engage, he will engage the Prey instructions, lowest remaining health. So say there's two investigators in the study, going back to the study now. Let's get these guys out of here. Say we pull this and say there is a, a second investigator in here. He looks just like me. If I pull this, the prey, so this is where it gets a little complicated. When you pull Ravenous Ghoul, even though he has prey instructions, say, um, say our, say our buddy, uh, <laughs> say our buddy Roland, and we'll just put health on him for demonstration purpose. Say this guy's hurt and we aren't. Say our twin is hurt and we're not. This is prey lowest remaining health, but since this Roland pulled the card, it still engages Roland. 
Prey only matters if you are equidistant away from this enemy, and then that's when it would become a, a factor. So for more demonstration purposes, I'm going to move this stuff out of the way a little bit. Let's get this crap out of here. There we go. Say there was another study here and another study here. And say, uh, and, uh, say we go back to this example and say, say we're both here. And say for some reason, say for some reason this ravenous ghoul is here. And then in the enemy phase, let's just pretend if we go to it, enemies with a hunter keyword move towards the nearest investigator. This particular ghoul doesn't have the hunter keyword. But if he did, he would move... And as I've told you a moment ago, there can never be a ready monster at a location that is unengaged with an investigator if they're also at that location. But who does he engage in this scenario? Well, because he's walking in the enemy phase, he would then go after the lowest remaining health. So he would engage this particular Roland, not this particular Roland. That's what prey is used for. It's just a it's just to, to determine the course of action a ravenous ghoul will take. Remember, a ghoul will always go after the closest enemy, no matter what. Or a, or a hunter, would be best to say. So here's another example. Say, say, um, let's see. Say, how about this? Say there's a Roland here and a Roland here. And say this Roland is hurt. And this one isn't. This says prey is the lowest remaining health. So when we get to the enemy phase, each engage enemy, uh, excuse me, enemies with a hunter keyword move towards the nearest. Again, this is not a hunter, so he would never do this, but pretend he is. He would move towards the closest investigator first always. Remember, monsters are, uh, are opportunists when it comes to attacking. It's always going to try to go towards the closest. But if there are equidistant investigators and this thing hunts it would go for the lowest remaining health so one location away one location away raven school goes this way all right so that's how prey works some people get that wrong they assume that if this roland's up here he's going to walk here first then in the next enemy phase go here no he doesn't he always goes for the closest target it's when there's equidistant targets that the prey becomes a factor so Hopefully that clarifies prey and how that works. Sometimes these prey rules and, and hunting rules, they all get a little bit weird. So going back to this example, we're going to stick this ghoul into, into the uh, engagement. So, And we can just delete all of this. Pew. All right, so back to where we were. Ghoul minion has engaged us because we drew it in the mythos phase. And now it is the investigation phase. Now... Roland has a bunch of actions he could do, but if he doesn't, if since he's engaged with an enemy, if he doesn't fight, evade, parlay, or resign, he is going to be attacked by this monster for free, which means he would take one damage and one horror if he was to do anything other than what it says on the bottom of this card. We're not going to do that because we have a machete and a beat cop in our assets here, so we're, we're feeling decently confident. We'll put this up here. We're feeling decently confident we can fend off a ghoul minion with our machete in play. So, we're going to do an example of a fight attack, and we're going to do an example of an evasion. A fight action and an, 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 an evasion, or evade. Fight, evade. So, starting with fight, what we would do in this case is we would say, okay, um, we could fight. So let me make a differential here. This is important. I could fight, which means I would take my four fist. I would compare it to his two fists. I would pull a token. Let's say I pull a negative two. My four becomes a two. He's got a two. I hit him and I do one damage. This is assuming we're not using the machete. Because if you just take the fight action, you don't get to bring your weapons to bear. Okay. To bring your weapons to bear, you would do activate a trigger ability on a card, right? Now, you might be saying, but Dean, you just told me if I don't fight or evade, I'm going to get attacked for free. That's true. But if you activate the trigger on the machete, it states the following. Fight. You get plus one attack. So this 
activating this trigger is telling you that you're going to now take the fight action with a plus one fist. And if it's the only enemy engaged with you, you're going to do plus one damage. So much better to fight with the weapon than with your fists. There are times where you might choose to use your fists instead of a weapon, especially if you have a firearm, which has limited bullets in it. You know, you might have not as much ammo in the gun, and maybe it only needs one damage, so why waste a great shot on something that's almost already dead, right? Those are decisions you'll make over the course of the game. But getting back to this, so we're going to fight with our machete. We're going to activate the machete trigger and fight. We pull a negative three. Our fight of four plus one is five, minus three is two, two to two ties. So we hit him and he takes two damage. He only has two, he's promptly discarded. Now, another thing occurs. This reaction trigger states, after you defeat an enemy, discover one clue at your location. So I could just take a clue for killing that enemy. Limit once per round. So then I would flip this indicating it's already been done. Okay, so that's how that works. We'll talk about triggers a little bit later. So getting back to this ghoul situation, let's say he's, he's not quite dead yet. There's a uh, couple of things here. Okay. So that's basically how you, how you would attack a ghoul minion. It's a basic, that's a basic fight action using a trigger on the machete. Now, suppose I wanted to evade the ghoul minion. Now, let's pretend we don't have a machete. Let's pretend we don't have a cop in our hand. And let's pretend that we have significant damage on us. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got one health left, and we are no longer in the... Uh, we have one health left, and for some reason, we're not confident we can defeat this thing. Um, Say, uh, say I have one action left and no weapons and nothing in my hand. I know that if I hit him and do one damage to him, that's well and good. But right after the investigation phase, the enemy phase is going to happen. And he's going to hit me at the end of the enemy phase for one and one, thus killing Roland Banks. So this is a difficult position to be in. This is a rare position for Roland to be in, to be clear. But for purposes of this demonstration, I'm asking you to stick with me. Now, let's actually, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lie. Let's pretend, let's pretend I have manual dexterity in my hand, okay? Say this is my only option. Say I'm down to this. I'm holding manual dexterity, which is a skill card, and, uh, and I have a ghoul minion that is going to kill me next turn. I have one action left. I can't move because if I move, not only does he go with me, but he hits me for free. So really, fight evade are my only options and punching him is not going to kill him leading to my death so i really need to evade this monster now to make an evasion check i would pit my agility of two against his of two so two to two makes us even steven not great we know the makeup of the comp we know the composition of the bag we know that since we have a ghoul enemy at our location we've got negative one negative one we know this is a negative one. We know this is a negative two. This is an auto fail. Negative twos all fail. Negative ones all fail. There's only three, make it, only four tokens in the bag, which would allow me to live in this particular moment. I'd have to pull one of those. That's a 25% chance of success. Four out of 16, right? Not great. So 75% chance I fail this evasion and die. Now, this is where we get into doing something with cards calling committing cards. Now, you can commit cards to skill checks. When you commit a card to a skill check, you say that's what you're doing. So in this case, you're going to say, I'm going to evade the ghoul. I'm going to commit manual dexterity to this check. Now, when you commit a card to a check, if it's a skill card, it doesn't cost anything, number one. Number two... Skill cards, if you, this says max one permit, one committed per skill test. If you, if you succeed, you get to draw a card. Well, I also get to not die. So one thing at a time here. So we're starting with this. Now, when we commit something, we take the icons on it. So we got one and two agility icons. We add it to ours. That gives us a four to two. Suddenly, the bag possibilities open up. 
A fortitude means we succeed on anything with the exception of three tokens now. Because four to two, these all don't get me below two, right? You know how that math shakes out. So if I commit manual dexterity to this check, I have a four agility. And if I reach in and pull a negative two, that means I'm dropped to a two. My agility of two is equal to the ghoul minions two. So that means I successfully evade the enemy. Well, that's great, but what does that mean? Well, I discard my manual dexterity. Now he's evaded. What that means is that the ghoul minion, I unengage from him. Now, when you unengage with an enemy, he essentially just goes to your location, but he's not in your threat area. And he exhausts, and that's key. For an enemy to attack you, they must exhaust. So in the enemy phase, what happens is, say, uh, say, say we're back here, and the enemy phase rolls around. After the hunters all move on the rest of the board, this guy would attack me. So he would, in, he would exhaust and hit me for one and one, I would die. He's exhausted. But right after enemy phase is upkeep, so he would unexhaust again. Right? Now, if you're starting to piece this together, you see why evasion in this particular case is good. So going back to this, manual dexterity, pull a negative two. He successfully evaded. What does that mean? That means he is disengaged and exhausts and at my location. Now, because he is not ready or exhausted, when you're exhausted, you're not ready. They're interchangeable. I told you before, there cannot be a ready enemy at your location that's not engaged with you. There is one exception. There's an enemy called, uh, there's an enemy with a keyword aloof, which means they are not, they don't automatically engage you. You actually have to engage them, right? But we don't, we're not going to worry about aloof enemies <laughs> right now. So, he, since he is not ready, he doesn't just automatically engage me after I evade him. So Roland manages to slip the ghoul who is now exhausted. Okay. Now, that was my last action, and that would conclude the, investi the investigation phase. Now, in the enemy phase, as each engaged enemy attacks a fable, well, he's not engaged. He is unengaged and exhausted in the study. So Roland is safe. However, upkeep phase rolls around. We reset all of our tokens, including this one. And we draw a card. Well, let's just say we draw this. Uh, I'm going to say we draw something else. How about that? Perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. We draw a card. So now we got this card. And we're going to say these are not in play for the purposes of this evasion. We just drew this. This has been discarded. Okay, because we're following the upkeep phase. Reset, ready, exhausted. Each investigator draws a card and gains a resource, right? So we're going to just grab one of these. Now, this is very important. Reset actions, ready, exhausted cards. Once this ghoul minion readies, he must follow the rule that states there cannot be a ready monster at your location that's not engaged with you. Any ready monster immediately engages an investigator at that location. So once he readies an upkeep, he re-engages me. Scary, I still only have one health. Now the difference is, I know that when we finish our upkeep phase, come back up to Mythos, that if I survive Mythos phase, <laughs> which is a big if, I then get to go before him. Which means I could try to punch him to death with my three free actions versus evading him, okay? That's how evasion works. It's, it's very handy to, to evade. Uh, you know, some people, some, some decks specialize in evade. They have five, five agility, you know, rogues are big evaders, etc. So a lot of it is, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're hitting the pause button on the enemy <laughs> because you do eventually have to deal with them unless you can get out of the scenario without, without facing uh, the enemy. But Usually you're just putting off the pain by constantly evading. At least I think so. So that's an example of one of the things you can do. Two of the things you can do, right? That's how you fight. That's how you evade. All right? Now, we're going to do something else here. I'm going to take this up here. And we're going to use Rotting Remains because I think this is a great, great card to learn skill checks with. 
So another type of skill check you can make is, let's go back to this example. In fact, we could have kept the ghoul in that pile. I put him away for no reason. Let's say he is still here, okay? And let's say we pull, uh, let's say on the mythos phase, we it says put a doom on the agenda. We do that. Now we know, oh my God, there's only one more doom to go before this advances. And remember, the goal is to advance the act deck, not the agenda deck. The enemies are going to do this. You're going to do this. But you pull this encounter card and then you flip it over and it says, Revelation, test will three for each point you fail by, take one horror. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. So revelation cards have to be dealt with immediately. And um, that's the last part of the mythos phase before I actually get to take a turn. But I do have to deal with this. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple permutations on skill checks. Roland's will is three. This is telling you to test against a three. So if we reach into the bag and we pull a negative three, let's say that's what we pull, that's terrible. Now that means our will is reduced to zero from the negative three. And since this test is a three, we failed by three points. We are going to take three horror, one, two, three, which is almost all of Roland's sanity. Roland only has a five sanity. That's not great. So that would be really rough. Okay. Now there's another thing that could happen. Suppose I pull a negative four. Now this is important. If I pull a negative four, my, my willpower, technically speaking, should be negative one. So if my skill has now been reduced to negative one, does that mean I take four horror because I failed by four? Negative one is four away from three. So I think I take four horror, correct? That is not correct. Lucky for you, one of the small respites this game gives you <laughs> is that it says after all of your modifiers have been applied, the skill can only be reduced to zero. So if you're a smart individual, you'll note that if I pull a negative three or a negative four, I'm still taking three horror in this instance, right? It's good to know. After all modifiers have been applied, the lowest your skill can be reduced to is zero. It's very important because zero to zero is a success, okay? Now, what about this token? Auto fail. Auto fail has two distinct parts of the token. It says you automatically fail. And then it says your skill is considered zero for the purposes of the test results. So I automatically fail and my, I'm reduced to zero. Now, suppose I had a five willpower instead of a three. If I had a five willpower instead of a three and I drew this token, I would still fail by three because I automatically fail, even though it's a five to a three, and my skill is effectively zero, which means I fail by three. Okay. And that's a bit how the, uh, that gives you an indication as to the chaos bag. That's how we led into this segment, right? How it would work, right? And then there's other things like cultist token. You would consult this negative one. If you fail, take a horror. Well, suppose I did fail this. Um, this is a really crappy one to pull in this instance because you could take up to four horror damage. Because if you get a negative one, say you only have a two, uh, say you only have a one will, very, very unlikely, and you pull this, you'd have a zero will, you'd fail, you'd take three, and then you take another one because of the scenario card indication, which states if you fail, take one horror onto the uh, cultist icon. Not great. So that's an example of skill checks and why the chaos bag matters and what is in the chaos bag matters. Different campaigns will feature different tokens. Sometimes you'll see a negative five or even a negative six in there. Depending on the difficulty you play, you might see multiple negative threes, multiple negative fours with very few negative ones and zeros. It really depends on the scenario and how difficult it's going to be. But that's precisely how one would do a skill check. Okay. So the skill checks we covered are we taught you how to fight, which was to use an, we, we did all, all of these actually. We did activate by, 
we did activate an action trigger, which we did with the machete when it was in play. We did in we did a fight an enemy at your location, which is great. So there's a couple of things like that. There's one more skill check I'd like to show you guys, which is investigate, because this is where things can get strangely tricky. So we're going to take, I guess I could talk about allies a little bit too. We're going to take flashlight in this instance. Okay. So if we come back over here, say these two items have been put into play. And, and truthfully, I probably should talk a little bit about that. I haven't even told you how to put things into play. <laughs> All right. We'll explain to you how to get cards in your hand and how to get them into your, onto your board in just a moment. But that's, that's where this comes in. We're going to start with flashlights. So say our flashlight's in play. It has three supplies on it because that's what the card says. It's a hand slot. The guard dog is an ally slot, and if you look down here, you can see what your different slots have. I believe this is artifact, arcane, arcane. I don't know if it's artifact. I think it's artifact. Artifact, arcane, arcane, tarot, hand, hand, ally, and body slot. So once you have those fill, you can only you can't put other assets like that into play. There's limited location spots. You only have two hands, right? Now, here's a strange one. Say one of the, say say there are no enemies. We have nothing to worry about. We have a flashlight. We're in the study. We know that there's two clues in the study. How do we know that? Well, because when the study is entered by Roland, we flip it over and we're told to put two times investigator clues on it. So that's what we do. Roland says, great, I want to investigate. So Roland is going to investigate. Now, much like fight, he could take a raw investigate, which is to pit his intellect of three, which is the book there, against the shroud value of the study, which is two. So three to two means I'm already ahead of the game, so to speak. Now, I could also do an activated action trigger on a card, which is exactly what I'm going to do with flashlight. Flashlight states spend an action trigger, spend a supply. So we're going to do that. We're going to spend a supply. Our flashlight battery is getting low. And our investigation gets negative two shroud from this location. So the shroud of the study is effectively reduced to zero. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, we have an intellect of three. Suppose we pull a negative four on this skill check. Say we reach into the bag and, ah, uh, a negative four comes up. This is terrible. What does that mean? That means my skill of negative of three drops to negative one, much like in the prior example. But what did I tell you in the prior example? After all modifiers have been applied, the lowest your skill can be is zero, which means... Since the flashlight has reduced the shroud to zero, you would succeed and get a clue. This is something often missed by newer folks, this uh, permutation right here, right? Now, in this case, when we're at utilizing the flashlight to spend a supply and investigate with a negative two shroud, that also means that negative three is the same, same outcome, same outcome, because whether it's negative three reducing my, my intellect to zero, or negative four, reducing it to negative one, and then effectively zero, I get the same result, success. So whether I pull the four or the three, I get the same, I get the same result. Confused yet? <laughs> That's one of those things about Arkham that, again, a lot of people missed the first time, and you would get that clue. Okay. So that's something that I think is very important to note. We're going to do one more quick example. I'm going to bring the ravenous ghoul back into play. Suppose this man is in our threat area, and suppose it is the enemy phase. For some reason, we've acted this turn, we're done, and uh, now the enemy is getting a chance to attack. And he is now going to hit us for one damage and one sanity. See his card here? Now... Taking damage or being dealt damage just means that you have received damage as Roland Banks. You've taken it and now you must assign it. That's very important. Now you must assign the damage. Okay? So, in this instance, the ravenous ghoul <laughs> is attacking us 
And suppose we are a bit nervous. Say we are banged up yet again with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three. Say we're really hurting, okay? Ravenous school is going to, we've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to have one health and one sanity left if I let this guy hit me. I do have a trusty guard dog. Now, if you'll know, on the bottom of the guard dog's card, it has health and sanity on its own. When you take damage, you decide how you want to assign that damage. So I could easily say, dog's going to take one. Now, if the dog takes one, one sanity, that will lead to its death when we resolve damage. But I think I got to risk it. Boom. So the dog's going to take one health and one sanity, which is precisely what the ghoul does. But the dog has a reaction trigger called when an enemy attack deals damage to guard dog, deal one damage to the attacking enemy. So as the dog dies, the dog bites the ghoul for one damage. And we took none. Okay? That would exhaust the ghoul as he's already attacked us which doesn't really matter. I never really exhaust enemies because right after enemies is upkeep and they unexhaust anyway, so I don't like to needlessly turn cards. But it's good to remember that when they attack, they are exhausted, with one exception, if they make an attack of opportunity, okay? So the dog would get discarded, you would take a damage, and that's that. All right. So, speaking of attacks of opportunity, let me explain to you how that works. Say Roland has three six damage on him and three san and, and three uh so he's got two sanity and three health left. Not great. And suppose it's the start of Roland's turn. I know it's in here. Where's my machete? Is it not in the starter deck? Because if not, that's really funny. You'd think it would be. It is. Okay, good. So suppose this is in my hand with mind over matter. Okay, pretend it's the start of the investigation phase. All right, I have a machete in my hand. Okay, I have a three fight, which means I only have a few tokens that would allow me to successfully hit this ghoul. I think four in total. That's terrible because when the ghoul goes, he's going to put me in a real difficult position after he hits me. I do have a machete in my hand, and I'd like to put the machete into play. Okay. To play an asset or to play an event, you simply take a play action, and you spend the requisite resources for the card. So let's say we've got enough money to cover this. Otherwise, this example is not great. So I say, you know, I really want my machete into play. So my first action... I'm going to bring the machete into play. I'm going to spend the three resources to get it into play. Now we've just we've just in, we've just provoked an attack of opportunity because it, over here it says if you're engaged with an enemy and spend an action to do anything other than fight, evade, activate a parley, or resign, you will be attacked. Now, after he attacks me, I told you a moment ago when an enemy attacks, they exhaust. The exception is attacks of opportunity. Enemies do not exhaust when they make attacks of opportunity, which makes them particularly dangerous, which makes attacks of opportunity particularly dangerous because they're going to hit you on your turn, the investigation phase, and then they're going to hit you on their turn, assuming they're still alive, right? So that's part of the calculation. The assuming they're still alive is part of the calculation here because I know if I'm this hurting and I don't have a machete in play, I have to punch him for one damage. I don't have a lot of help in me, but in, at least in this case, I have a chance. So I risk it. I put the machete into play. Now, before the machete actually enters play, technically speaking, the attack occurs. So I would take one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven damage on me. I think is what that is. And I would take a sanity hit as well. So I take another, whoopsie, wrong token. I would take a horror. Oh my, this is really bad. Then I finish putting the item into play spending the resources. The reason that timing is important is because of this. Suppose I had the guard dog in my hand and instead of playing the machete, I played the guard dog. 
a lot of time, and I did this when I first played, I would put the guard dog into play. I would spend the three resources to get it into play. And then I'd have the ghoul initiate his attack of opportunity. And then I would put the damage on the enemy that came into play. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. What happens is that the second you do the thing that provokes the attack of opportunity, which is to play guard dog, you take the hit. You spend the money, you take the hit, then the guard dog's in play. So you have to take the damage before the guard dog is in play, okay? That's an important distinction. But before that, we're back on the machete. We brought the machete into play. We took our damage. And uh, he doesn't exhaust because it's an attack of opportunity. Then I would attack him with one of my actions, pull a negative two. He would take two. And then I would attack him again with one of my actions, pulling a zero. He would take another two, and he would be dead. And that's, that's pretty important. Um, so yeah, that's some basic skill check stuff. I hope, uh, I hope it's something that, you know, skill checks, the whole zero thing and below zero and negatives and attacks of opportunity and timings can be a little bit funky, but hopefully they've been defunkified. Now, I've told you I would get into the uh, round sequence next, and that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, so in the round sequence, you skip the mythos phase in the first turn. The mythos phase is the way the game is going to try to kill you because you place a doom on the agenda, right? And then once you hit the threshold, you would advance. So say we were starting a turn, say this was the third turn of the game, there was already two doom in play on the agenda, and we would start with the mythos phase. We would put one on, the agenda would advance, which would mean we would pull the card off, flip it over, and read the card. And then you would know all the bad things that are happening to you. That's what the game's trying to do. So by that rationale, you can see that the game will kill you on a long enough timeline. I've said that a couple times now. And for us, we are trying to advance this act deck. So we want to take the number before the investigator and multiply it by the investigator. So in this case, two times one, there's only one, one guy, that's Roland. He's by himself. Two times one is two. So we need two clues here for us to advance the act deck, which would have us reveal and press on. Our goal is to get through the act deck and survive. The enemies want to push this. They push it in the mythos phase. Lucky for you, you skip the mythos phase on the first turn. <laughs> so investigation phase, let's talk about that a little bit. We already talked about skill checks and how they work, but let's talk about cards. So you probably know you have five cards, three, four, five. I hope these cards make sense. So you'll notice that there are Asset, event, asset, asset, event. There are no skill cards in my hand, and that works out perfectly. Because if you remember before, I gave you the example of committing manual dexterity to a skill check to evade a ghoul. Now, suppose you didn't have a skill check, excuse me, suppose you didn't have a skill card to commit to that action. You can commit any card to a skill check. You can commit any card to a skill check. Committing should not be and never be conf confused with playing. Playing a card is one thing, committing a card is something else. The second you commit a card, with the exception of skill cards, because remember the skill card tells you what happens if you succeed. All of these cards are not designed, at least their primary function is not to be committed to skill checks. Their primary function is to be used for example, I want to put a knife into play. I'm going to play the card. That's one thing you can do here. Play an event or asset card from your hand, okay? I would pay the one resource cost for it. So one, two, three, I would take this and put it in the token pool and my knife would be in play. I'd be done with one of my actions. Great, great. Now, suppose I was in a position where I had to punch a bad guy and I don't have any help, and I need some help. Instead of playing my knife, I could fight the bad guy and commit the knife to the check. Now, when you commit something to the check, don't think about it as playing it. Remember, when you commit something, the cost goes away, and the text on the card is irrelevant, unless it's a skill card, which we already discussed with manual dexterity. So if you commit this card, it doesn't cost you one, you don't get any of this stuff. It's, it's, it's blank for most purposes. 
All you're looking at is that fist symbol. That fist symbol would bump my fish from four to five. You can commit any number of cards to a skill check. So say I really needed to pass. I could take, I could commit all three of these cards to the skill check, getting one, two, three fist added to my fist of four, making it a seven. I really need to hit that thing. Obviously, this is suboptimal. You would never want to commit all these assets and events to your skill check, but there are times where you just might have to, okay? And that's what these icons mean. Some of these cards have two icons, like mind over matter. There's a fist and a foot. You could use it for either type of test. And if you do, you ignore the cost, you ignore the flavor text. Going back to this example, if we pull manual dexterity as a skill card designed for this purpose, skill cards are committed, right? This says in max one committed, if the test is successful, draw a card. So how, I, if I'm evading something and succeed with this committed to it, I get to draw a card upon success. That's great. When you commit assets and events, you don't get any such thing. All you're getting is the icons from the cards. That's the difference. Investigators at your location can also commit to your skill test by helping you, but they can only commit one card. Okay. So when an asset is played, you spend the money, it goes into play into your asset area. If you, if you come back down to the manual, um, I, I put the manual away, but you'll see it over here. You, you put this stuff into the left of your investigator card. Investigator card will go here, hand assets here, etc. So this would be in play versus, and that's one action, versus something like playing an event. Events you pay for, remember, we're not committing it, we're playing the event, so this costs us one, and it states event one, fast, which means it doesn't take an action. So I don't have to flip this token over, which is great. I still have two actions after I play this card. And this card states, play only during your turn. Until the end of the round, you may use your book in place of your fist and foot. That's pretty cool. I mean, not great for Roland. This is a terrible card in Roland's deck. The only thing this does is it gives me a plus one agility until the end of the round. So even though this would be discarded, not a terrible idea to keep it nearby to remember you're getting those effects. And then at the end of the round, you promptly discard it. Emergency cash is another great example of an event card. You pay zero for this event, and then you gain three resources. So I would say I'm going to play emergency cash. It's discarded, and I'm going to get three resources. That's great. Okay, that's how that works. That's pretty much playing cards. It's not, it's not super complicated, to be completely honest with you. Most of the weird permutations come upon things like fast and below zero totals and all that jazz, as you've already seen. Some of the other actions you can take, you can move. So let's for fun say, we've already done this example, say there's another uh, location down here. Pretend it's not a study and pretend they are connected. They're not, but pretend they are. Move to a connecting location. Great. Roland could walk to this location, and when he does, this location reveals, and you follow the rules, which is to place two clues on it. Okay? How do I know that? Because it's two times investigator's clues. So you put them on there immediately when it's revealed. There's two sides to the locations, revealed and unrevealed. Obviously, everything comes into play unrevealed, and it's not revealed till you get there. Okay, so you can draw a card as an action. You can gain a resource as an action, so take one from the pool. Both drawing cards and gaining resources is not great, strategically speaking. There are times when it might be the only thing you can do and it makes sense, or if you really need to get a, a, if you really need to get a resource because on the next turn you're going to put something expensive into play, it might work. But by and large, tempo is important in this game. It's a bit of a intermediate to advanced concept, I would say, and that is making sure you are ahead of schedule with the game. If you waste actions, if you're not efficient with your actions, it will, it will haunt you. It will come back and bite you in the ass for sure. So you can draw a card, gain a resource. You can play an asset or card from your hand. You can activate an ability on a card. You can move. You can investigate. You can take a basic fight or evade. Okay. You can do all of these multiple times as long as you still only do three actions. So you could draw, draw, draw. I could draw three cards. One, two, three. I could get one, two, three resources. That's the end of my turn. That's a terrible turn, by the way. 
Um, I could fight three times. Fight, fight, fight. Okay. I could... Um, is there anything in here that exhausts? Because that's important. I don't think so. There's no exhausting... Oh, wait a minute. Um, nope. Yeah, I was seeing if there was something here that uh, <laughs> that exhausted for me to play it, but I don't see anything, which is too bad. Yeah. We talked about exhausting enemies, right? That's something we did talk about. I'm trying to remember uh, what cards exhaust to to attack with them. Ah, uh, da 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 da. I think the Mauser exhausts. Yep. So I'm gonna grab a card. Now, Roland cannot have this card. <laughs> this is a rogue card. But stick with the, the, with the example. So you got three actions. I told you you can do one action multiple times, with one exception. Say I have the Mauser in play, even though I can't, because it's not legal to this character, because Roland cannot take rogue cards. You'll see that on the back of his deck. He can take Seeker, Neutral, and Guardian cards. So remember, you'll never see a Mauser in his hand, outside of weird shenanigans. And say I have this in play, and say I have, uh, say I'm dealing with the enemy again. He's in here somewhere, isn't he? Yeah. Say I'm fighting this jerk, and I'm like, well, I gotta shoot the flesh eater. This says, so I take the, I take the activate trigger. Trigger says exhaust Mauser C96 and spend one ammo. Fight. You get plus one fist and deal plus one damage for this attack if you succeed by two or more. So if I do that, forget about the test, doesn't matter. I then exhaust the card. I cannot shoot it again because it's exhausted. But not just because it's exhausted. Don't be confused by that language. The reason you can't shoot it again is not because it's exhausted. It's because you can't exhaust it again. It says, exhaust Mauser, spend ammo, fight. You can't exhaust something that's already exhausted, correct? So you can't do it. That matters because there are some cards that have other abilities in addition to something that exhausts them that you would still get as long as it's not calling for the card to exhaust. That's a, that's a pretty, uh, that's a deep cut, but that matters. So I flip this token, exhaust the Mauser, I shoot. This thing has five ammo. That's a good thing about it. I spend an ammo, I shoot, I miss, that's it. It's a slow gun. It's a slow, a slow reload process, apparently. It's like a freaking crossbow. All right. So that's an example where you couldn't use this gun three times because it does exhaust to activate. Then I would be punching, punching if I'm fighting a flesh eater. <laughs> so, all right. That is pretty much your actions, right? We talked about some of the triggers. Uh, you'll see cards that have triggers on them. Um, we've already discussed the free reaction trigger. Now we're going to talk about, I believe it's a free reaction trigger. Where the hell is it? It's physical training, and it's in this deck. And it's not a great card, in my opinion. But uh, let's be real. These, uh, these starter decks are terrible, <laughs> for the record. They're not great. They're quite bad. Now, suppose this asset was in play. And I was punching this guy. And let's pretend I've got some money. Let's say I've been saving up my money. Now, this is saying... Lightning Bolt, spend one resource, you get plus one uh, will for this skill test, or Lightning Bolt, spend one resource, you get plus one fist. Now, I've got nothing else in play, so my physical training is going to come in handy when trying to hit the Flesh Eater, because he fights at a four, he's equally he's equal at fighting to me. Since this is a resource spending card, and I got the cash to spend, I think I'm going to use it to make sure I can hit this guy. But let's consult the manual real quick. I want to look at triggers, and I want to look at the free trigger ability. We'll start there, page three. I think we cover this a little bit, but all your trigger abilities are here, right? This tells you um, trigger abilities. Trigger ability is an ability prefaced by a lightning bolt, a little curvy arrow, or the right-facing arrow. If the ability has one or more prerequisites, these are listed in text immediately following the icon. Going back to the Mauser example, the Mauser had a cost, which is to exhaust it, okay? A player must always meet the prerequisites of a trigger to trigger the ability, and then there are multiple types. There's free trigger abilities. A free trigger may be triggered as a player ability during any player window, okay? We'll talk about player windows right now, I guess. Reaction triggers may uh, 
apply with a specific triggering condition may be met. Going back to that, we did that earlier, right? That's when, when we defeated an enemy, pardon the terrible camera work. When we defeated an enemy, we utilized this after you defeat an enemy. So that's telling you what causes the reaction trigger to go forward. And it is optional. It's may. That's important. Triggers are all may. You don't have to take the trigger if you don't want. This says discover one clear your location after you defeat an enemy, which we showed you earlier, okay? And then the other kind of trigger is the regular action trigger, which we talked about, which does require an action. And we've, uh, we're not going to get too deep on that. But these, these free reaction triggers, uh, there's free trigger, reaction trigger. So free reaction, that's the differential. And this just states a free triggered ability may be triggered as a player ability during any player window. Uh, player windows is a bit of an advanced concept in this game, and they are a bit annoying. <laughs> but you'll see them here. Player windows are these lightning bolt sections that tell you when you can do certain things. And then they also exist in the middle of a skill test. So I'm gonna to go to the end of this book to show you what I'm talking about here, there it was. So this tells you when you can, in what, where in the phase you can play these. And then within a particular moment, say you're taking a skill test, when you can do a player window. So skill test timing, this is relevant to the example that we're about to show you. Determine skill test. Well, we're going to make a fight test, player window, commit cards, player window, reveal chaos token. So essentially just know that you can do this before you pull a token. That's important. So over here, we're going to fight the flesh eater by making a skill check. Now, before we go into the token bag, where's my damn tokens? Before we go into the token bag, we are going to utilize this trigger. Now, there is no parentheses saying limit three times per turn, once per turn, or any of that stuff. So as much money as I have, I can spend on this. I can spend one for a plus one, two for a plus two, three for a plus three. Sure. Sure. I'll do a plus three. That brings my fight from four to seven, and then I pull a token. Minus three. Seven minus three is four. Four is four. Four is equal to four, so I hit him for one. Okay. So that's just how some triggers work. Okay. I think that covers pretty much your actions and pretty much the round sequence. On the Mythos face, you place a Doom. You advance Threshold if it's satisfied. That's very important to consider. There'll be times when you're playing this game and you have two Doom on the agenda and then a card will come into play. Pretend this is a card that comes into play that has it. And some cards come into play that have Doom on them. Now, see, that means one, two, threes in play. Do we immediately advance? No, and this is important. Place one Doom, advance agenda if Doom threshold is satisfied. So you only check it during that moment in the Mythos phase. Once you draw an encounter card that gets Doom put on it, which you will see happen, you don't check again. That doesn't happen until the next Mythos phase. So just remember that, okay? That's a, more of an advanced concept. We're not going to go too deep on that stuff. Investigation phase we covered at great length. <laughs> um, enemy phase we talked about moving, etc. And then your upkeep phase and all that jazz. So yeah, that's a basic rundown of your actions, your skill tests, and what you can do within the round sequence. All right, another quick example of uh, something I want to get into that I didn't get too much into initially is I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, drawing weaknesses and how that works. So every investigator has a weakness tailored to that particular investigator, just like they have something cool. So Roland Banks has an asset called Roland's 38 Special. He also has cover-up, and cover-up is bad. Now, Let's say we are in our upkeep phase, right? Let's say that the turn's just about over. Upkeep, one of the last things we do, uh, well, we reset our actions, ready, exhausted, uh, get a card, and gain a resource. So let's just play this out. We draw a card. Oh, no, we've drawn cover-up. Cover-up has a revelation which says, put cover-up into play in your threader with th three clues on it. That's not good. And it says, when you would discover one or more clues at your location, discard that many clues from cover-up instead. And then when the game ends, if there are any clues on cover-up, you suffer one mental trauma. This is not a great card. <laughs> this stinks to pull. Um, so we got our resource from upkeep, 
And let's just say this is the position we find ourselves in. All right, we've pulled cover up, say, very early. We're still in the study of the first scenario of the first campaign. So now Roland has to investigate the study because we can't do anything else. So we flip this token over. We take our intellect of three versus the shroud of one. We've got really no help in our hand, but we're lucky. We pull a negative one. So our skill goes from three to two. Two is equal to the shroud. We succeed. We gain a clue, but we don't gain a clue, do we? Because of this card, which again has a reaction trigger, which states, um, when you would discover one or more clues at your location, discard that many clues from cover up instead. Now, reaction triggers, if I am not mistaken, this is, a, this is actually a, a lifetime potential rule thing that could be a bit complicated. See how it's a reaction trigger? Now, I believe that makes this optional, which means I could take the clues from the study. However, I am risking not getting the three clues off of this, thus I'm risking mental trauma. I believe that's the case. And anytime you're not sure, you can always consult the rule book. So let's go back to the rule book and look up reaction triggers. Uh, da, 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 da. It's called a reaction trigger, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe it's handled on right on page three. All right, let's take a look. A triggered ability is an ability prefaced by either a free action, that's the lightning bolt, a reaction, which is the little turny arrow, and then a play action. If the ability has one or more prerequisites, these are listed in the text immediately following the icon. A player must always meet the prerequisites of a triggered ability in order to trigger this ability. There are three types of triggered. Free triggered abilities. A free triggered ability may be triggered as a player ability during any player window. A reaction triggered ability. A, tr a reaction triggered ability with a specified triggering condition may be triggered any time that triggering condition is met, right? And then it says action triggers, same thing. That's all very important language. You will notice that as you play this game more and more, you will get what I like to call the Arkham Horror Law Degree. I'm still working on mine, to be honest with you, because there's so many little rules like this that are easy to miss. May be triggered, right? may be triggered. That's a very important word in this game. In fact, it's probably in the damn book. It is. <laughs> Page 15. Quick, consult Arkham Law Book. The word may indicates that a specified player has the option to do that, which follows. Option. So, instinct might suggest, oh, I have to just, okay, uh, Roland succeeds, going back to this example, right? Roland, su Roland succeeds, he's going to take a clue off because he has to. He doesn't have to. But if you start getting too cute with cover up, you might say, you know what, screw cover up. And you just play the game and then you take a mental trauma. The reason this card, the reason how this card tempts you to not ignore it is by threatening you with mental trauma if there are any clues on this at the end of the game. Now, if it was physical trauma, who cares? This card wouldn't be a big deal at all. Roland has nine health. But mental trauma is not good. So let's suppose we buzz our way through the scenario ignoring cover-up. When we start our next game, and by game, that's kind of not really good language. When we start the next scenario within the campaign, so in this particular instance, Night of the Zealot, when we finish gathering, say we finish this, and Roland has uh, all his clues on cover-up. Well, when we start Midnight Masks, Roland is going to have something called mid, uh, uh, tr mental trauma. So you can see I was already anticipating this. So Dean, me, Roland is who I'm playing. Let's say I got 3 XP. Don't worry about how. Boom, mental trauma. What that means is that at the very start of the next scenario, I, and as part of the setup, I take mental trauma. In fact, let's bust out the how to play manual. Let me get that sucker going. And I'll show you. I don't want that one. Oh, yeah, I do want that one. What am I doing? I'm, I've, I've broken the game. Uh, yeah. No, no, that's frequently asked questions. Where's my manual? Where's my manual? Where's my book? What the hell? Oh, it's up here. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So if we buzz back to the front of this when it comes to setup, you'll know one of the steps, right? We went through this already. 
But if I draw your attention to... Um, is it in here? Assemble a bag, take resources, draw opening hands. Read the gathering. Um, oh, for the first scenario, I, because it's a beginner scenario, I think it's being kind to you. It's not telling you about the trauma piece because this is just your first game setup and you're not going to have trauma in the first game. Um, let's see if this book has a how do you set the game up outside of your first action. It must. It doesn't, but the rule reference does. So we're going to go to the back of the rule reference and I'll show you exactly what I mean. There's... The back of this book is very, very handy. It gives you all kinds of useful information. Setting up the game right here. Choose investigators. Each player chooses a different investigator and places that investigator's card in his play area. Then take trauma or horror. In campaign play, each player places damage equal to his or her physical trauma and horror equal to his or her mental trauma on his or her investigator card. And trauma just means you take damage of that type. Sorry, that was a little bit clunky to get to, but that is very important. Now, a savvy individual will say, well, what if I'm just playing a one-shot campaign? What if I'm playing a, a one, what if I'm just playing a one-shot game? That's only one scenario. Well, then this isn't a big deal. <laughs> that's the reality. It's really bad in campaign play. Who cares otherwise? If you're doing a one-shot and there are many different scenarios, right? There are, all these, there are all these boxes, which you'll see when you start shopping around. And then there's something called standalone campaigns. So just as an example, if I click Carnival of Horrors, it's going to load it somewhere. Yeah, right here. So you'll see a lot of these. You can buy these packs. That's just a scenario. So who cares if you have mental trauma, if you're just going to play one scenario, right? It doesn't matter. It's a much more annoying in campaign play because going from five to four is really... It's, it's really dicey. As you've seen, some of these cards, you can take three in one shot. So, But that's, how, uh, that's, an example. that's one example of a weakness. Now, in addition to your character's weakness, you also have a random basic weakness. So let's pretend this is in our deck, and let's pretend we draw this card. Hypochondria. I can relate to this one. Revelation. Add hypochondria to your threat area. Forced. After you take one or more damage, take one direct horror. Oh my. So I'm going to explain to you what that means. After you take one or more damage, take one direct horror. And uh, there we are. Okay. So say our weakness is in play, and at the top of the mythos, we draw the ghoul. And uh, some, for some reason, we don't kill the ghoul with a machete with three actions. P.S. This would never happen. But stick with me. You have hypochondria, and the ghoul hits you. And um, let's see. Let's go. Let's let's give you an example of what direct horror is. Don't pay pay no attention to this mess. We're gonna bring up uh, beat cop. This is something that could be in a rolling deck. We'll take this card. We'll drag it down here. Okay. Say we've got beat cop in play, and say it's the enemy phase, and the ghoul minion attacks us. Well, we take one damage and one horror. We've already got one horror on us. Now, here's the way allies work, because allies can take damage. Yeah, he has his own health and sanity, two and two. We can assign any or all of the damage to the, to the cop. So we got one damage. One damage and one sanity coming in. So say we're like, you know what? We're going to put both of those on the cop. He can take one damage, one sanity. So the ghoul attacks the cop instead of me. Roland Bangs hides behind his cop friend. Now, that's all well and good, but let's take a look at what hypochondria states. Forced, after you take one or more damage, take one direct horror. Now, after you take one or more damage, that's a bit, that's a bit of a strange term. It just means taking as, as an investigator, meaning you, your allies, in your play area, anything like that, right? But direct horror means you cannot buff it. You can, there's, no, there's, no, uh, 
there's no buffer between you and the damage. So say I had on armor and I got a beat cop. Say this beat cop is, you know, say, say, well, it doesn't matter. So after this occurs, after the ghoul minion hits me for one and one and I elect to put that damage on the cop, I've still taken the damage. I've just assigned it to the cop. But now I have to take a direct horror. Direct means exactly that. I would come down here, whoopsie, and take a direct horror. Boom. Bad news for Roland, man. Bad news. Because you can't, you, direct is there's no, you can't stop it. It goes right onto your investigator card. You can't stop it with beat cop or any other assets that could soak damage for you. That stinks. All right. And one more example. Sometimes you'll see this. See how it says how there's an action trigger and another action trigger, and then it says discard hypochondria. That just means one, two actions to discard that, right? And as we uh, were saying, this game wants to slow you down. It wants to bog you down and make you take time to do things. Well, I wouldn't throw it out there and put it in my discard pile, but you get the point. So, yeah, it stinks. When you pull stuff like this, it says discard. Take two actions to discard it. No good. But probably worth it. It's probably worth it because, listen, <laughs> Roland Banks is a, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's not great with the sanity stuff, so. And then there's some other weaknesses in here, like internal injury, same deal. At the end of your turn, take one direct damage. That stinks, right? At the end of your turn, take one direct damage. Not good. Your turn ends at the end of the investigation phase, right? So... That's, uh, that's no good. Another waste two to get rid of it, but it's that or you're going to just die because you'll just start taking damage, right? So now that's pretty much weaknesses in a nutshell. So when you draw, when you pull a weakness, when you draw a weakness from your deck, you have to immediately play it, right? There are some effects that allow you to search your deck. You know, it might allow you to search. You might have a card. You might have something that lets you search the top three cards of your deck. So let's come up here and type in uh, overpower. So you might you might have uh, you might have an effect that lets you search search your deck. So say say um, say you have no hand, and you have an effect that says, "Oh, search search the top three cards of your deck and pick a card." You would go like this. You go, "All right, I'm searching my deck. If this is in it, you don't have to play it." It's only when you draw it, okay? Only when you draw a card do you do, does its revelation effect matter. So in this case, I search my deck. I go, ooh, I want dodge. And then I would return these to my deck, shuffle my deck, right? Now, to complicate my matters a little bit, but I won't go too deep on this, there are some investigators that state when searching your deck, if a weakness is among the cards searched, you must play it. Again, this gets back to RTFC, right? RTFC. Read the effing card. It'll always, uh, it'll always set you straight. All right. I think that's the end of the weakness example, and uh, let's move on. So, yeah, that's, that's just a quick example, a quick play example that'll help you get started a little bit, right? The other thing, too, is when you get that second, let's get this crap, but this doesn't matter. So when you do get that second clue, let's suppose this is the situation we're in. We've gotten the second clue. We flip over this card. I don't want to get into too much spoiler territory, but if you if you take this and flip it, it's going to say, put some things into play, put some more locations into play. So you're going to do that. Again, I don't want to spoil these scenarios, but that's something you would do, right? So the study would expand into other rooms once we've moved the act deck. And that's going to be different for every campaign because... That's the beauty of this game. There's so many interesting and unique scenarios in this in these campaigns. You also get experience at the end of campaigns. We're not going to cover deck construction. We're not going to we're not going to cover experience. We're not going to get too much into uh, you know acts and agendas moving. But um, let's just say that we that we are in a position where we're putting. Let's say let's say we're in the um, the mythos phase. We place one doom on the agenda. Uh oh. Three, we know the threshold is three. What does that mean? Well, this card tells me that advanced agenda if Doom Threshold is satisfied. I don't know. 
So what that means is all doom and play is taken away, even if there's some doom on locations, because that can happen. You delete all of it. And then you flip this over and some bad things happen. Okay. And that's it. All right. Well, that is a, that is a bit of a basic rundown of Arkham Horror, the card game. I hope you, I hope it helped you a little bit, right? Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for checking this out. I hope it helped you. Um, there's tons of stuff. Uh, there's tons more of, about this game. Um, there's so many permutations based on cards, scenario, et cetera. But just read, take your time and read everything you're supposed to read, and it will become much clearer to you over time. Definitely read the rule book. Definitely read the rule reference guide after that, and you will be well on your way to having tons of fun playing Arkham Horror, the card game. All right. Thank you guys so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Again, like and subscribe to this video is helping you at all. And, um, and with that, happy gaming. Thanks, guys.